Good afternoon, my name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is British Columbia's COVID-19 briefing for Monday, July the 27th. Honored to be here on the, the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be providing a written briefing at, a, at around three o'clock. And with that, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. Today we're reporting as we do over the weekend on three periods. From uh, Friday to Saturday, we had 36 new cases of COVID-19. Between Saturday and Sunday, there were 21 new cases. And Sunday to today, an additional 24 cases. That's a total of 81 uh, new cases who either tested positive and seven of whom were epidemiologically linked cases, bringing our total in British Columbia to 3,500 cases. That includes 1,064 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,800 uh, people in the Fraser Health Region, 143 people in Vancouver Island Health, uh, 353 people in the Interior Health Region, 80 people in Northern Health and 60 people who reside outside of Canada. We have now 264 active cases in British Columbia, of whom 11 people are in hospital, three of whom are in critical care or ICU. Unfortunately, we've had two additional deaths here in British Columbia, both of whom were residents in uh, long-term care in Vancouver Coastal, bringing our total to 193 people who died from COVID-19. And our condolences go to the families and the care teams and the communities of these people who have died most recently. We have 3,043 people who are now fully recovered from COVID-19. We have no new health care outbreaks. Uh, three remain active, one in long-term care and two in acute care. Um, we now have 664 cases in our health care outbreaks, um, an increase of two uh, in the staff uh, category, we 260 staff healthcare workers and 404 residents have been affected. We do have one new community outbreak uh, in the Fraser Health Region at the Fraser Valley Packing. It's a blueberry packing plant in the Abbotsford area and there are now 15 cases uh, associated with that plant as the investigation started uh, on uh, late Thursday and over the weekend. And Fraser Health is uh, working with the plant, um, doing ongoing testing of the uh, the residents and monitor. Uh, sorry, the residents, the workers at the at the plant, and doing an investigation to ensure that all of the safety need to be are in place. We now have uh, 14 uh, confirmed cases associated with the the outbreak that was declared on Friday in the Haida Gwaii area, and. As you know, health authorities in the BCCDC are also now posting all of the community exposure events that we've had, including flights and other locations where um, the public may have potentially been exposed when we can't identify everybody uh, who might be at risk. We now have over 1,010 people who are um, required to self-isolate in BC because they have been identified as being exposed to COVID-19 and at are, are at a high risk at the moment. And a reminder to people who have been identified as close contacts of cases. And if you have been told to self-isolate, this is not optional. This is a requirement. This is what you need to do now for the duration of the incubation period from when you were exposed to ensure that if you develop symptoms, you're not going to pass it on to others, particularly those that you're closest to. I understand this is difficult, especially now in the summer uh, where it means you cannot work. It means you have to stay away from your family and friends and not leave your home unless it's important to get medical care. Nobody wants this. And this is why it is so important that we continue to take our actions now to protect ourselves and protect each other as we move through our pandemic. We can all enjoy our summer, and we know what we need to do and ensu to ensure that our COVID-19 curve bends down again. Let's continue to take those necessary precautions to reduce the potential for this virus to spread in our communities, among our friends and our family. Start planning today for what you're going to be doing 
to make your VC day long weekend a safe weekend. And as I've been saying from the very beginning, go play outside, but play safe. Take this time to assess the risk before you're spending time with others, particularly people that are not in your close contacts, in your bubbles. Put measures in place to protect yourself and those that you care about. How will you give people the space to stay safe? Are you spending a short time together or are you spending a longer time together? Are the people that you're going to spend this time with in your bubble or have, do they have other contacts that might expose you? If you can't say yes to all of these questions about the risk, then be, say no to that activity and choose something else to do instead. Spending time outside is far safer, we know, than being indoors. So take advantage of that here in British Columbia in the coming weeks. Avoiding closed spaces, avoiding crowds, avoiding that close contact with people in any environment, inside or outside, are the things that are important for us to remember now. Ensuring you have safe physical distance is important, no matter where you may be. I will say again that this is not forever, but it is for now, and we know we can do this. We know that this is what will get us through the next months until we have an effective treatment or a vaccine. As you know, we've been focusing on taking actions in areas where we know there has been transmission and where transmission continues to occur. And last week, we modified our, our orders around restaurants and pubs and food and nightclubs and establishments like those. Today, I've amended the order on mass gatherings to limit the number of people in short-term rentals and vacation accommodations. So that includes places like houses that are being rented out, boat rentals, cabins, yurts, as well as hotels. maximum of five visitors. That means you cannot have a large group of people over to party in your hotel room or on your boat during this period of this, our COVID summer. It's the responsibility of the owner of the property to ensure that the order is adhered to and to ensure contact tracing information is collected for everyone, guests and visitors alike. This means that should somebody in your party have COVID-19, we are able to contact you all quickly and efficiently to prevent ongoing spread in our communities. We've also added some clarity about what an event is to the mass gathering order and to ensure that people know where it doesn't apply. And that includes, of course, workplaces, schools, um, secondary, post-secondary educational facilities, places like these. However, we have reinforced again the need to maintain the number of people that can be at a mass gathering with physical distancing and other measures in place at 50, and it will continue to stay at 50. When traveling as well here in BC, whether you're traveling or whether you're coming to BC from other places in Canada, we need you to travel safely, to use your travel manners, be courteous and considerate of those around us. Don't ask a venue or their staff to bend the rules. Thank them for their efforts they're making to keep all of us safe. That means that we cannot put tables together. We cannot gather in larger groups at restaurants or pubs or events. Those are the things that put the people who are working there at risk. Here in BC, we, we show the way to people. We bend the curve, not the rules. Let's use these summer days to bend our curve back down and protect everybody here in BC. And let's also remember to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, on behalf of the Premier and the government, I think people in BC who want to pass on, I want to pass on right off the, right, right away, the, our condolences to the families, the friends, the community, the people who are helping with care of the two people who passed away, one from Friday to Saturday and one from Saturday to Sunday uh, in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority in long-term care. We know what a difficult time it's been in long-term care. We're, we reflect on that every single day and we know how difficult it must be for the families who are dealing with the grief of the death of a loved one in this time. We want everyone to know that we understand and uh, to the extent that we can share their grief and we want to send them all our very 
best in this difficult time. Wanted to say that, of course, 81 cases over three days is uh, something we take seriously. Really, any number of cases, any number of active cases in the community are cases we take very seriously. Uh, in particular, we have a new outbreak today in the Fraser Health Authority, which is, uh, as always, is a cause for concern. And just as it has been in other cases, it's the work of public health to um, both on-site and through contact tracing br break as much as possible those chains of transmission. And when there is an outbreak, it shows why those, uh, those resources and uh, the precautions that we are taking and asking everyone to take are so important. wanted to note that there are 11 people uh, in uh, acute care hospital today across BC. That's minus one from where it was Friday. So that's 11 across BC. That's five in Fraser Health, uh, two in Interior Health, and four in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. We're again uh, at a fairly consistent level in terms of uh, emergency room visits. Uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday, we had 5,737 emergency room visits. I also wanted to acknowledge all of those who have uh, become an either re-registered or become emergency registrants in our health care system. We want to thank them again. They include 1,516 new health care assistants or care aides, 207 temporary uh, health care assistants, 441 registered nurses, five registered psychiatric nurses, 79 licensed practical nurses, two nurse practitioners, 64 allied health workers and 74 doctors and we express our appreciation to all of those people for the work they're doing in helping all of us uh, deal with not just COVID-19 uh, but all the health, health uh, emergency with respect to the overdose crisis and all of the other challenges in our health care system. That's a big thank you to all of them and all our health care workers. Uh, I want to provide my weekly update on uh, PPE. Today, as with previous weeks, I will report on how much PPE has arrived cumulatively and then specifically what has arrived in the last week. As you'll recall from last week's uh, report, uh, Monday, July 20th, so far just over 6 million N95 or equivalent respirators come to BC, almost 26 million surgical or procedure masks, 2,310,000 pieces of eye protection, 63 million pairs of gloves and just over 3,500,000 gowns. Um, today I can tell you that over the last week, since uh, the update on Monday, July 20th, up until yesterday, we've received 11,528 N95 or equivalent respirators, 3,237,950 surgical or procedure masks, 86,689 pieces of eye protection, 2,788,750 pairs of gloves and 1,197,108 gowns. We'll continue to source and test our PPE and are working hard to pursue all, any and all credible leads for safe and effective product for our health system. And I continue to thank all of those working on that project for all they've contributed in, uh, in the last few months. In closing, I just want to say that COVID-19, I think, has drawn on our greatest strengths as British Columbians, our generosity, our empathy, our understanding, our compassion, and our kindness. We pulled together and we made sacrifices. And for many of us, the sacrifices have been heartbreaking. We know the job that must be done to keep us safe. Where we stand today is due to our individual and collective efforts to stop the spread. We made a difference because each of us is the difference. And it is this difference, the discipline that saw us bend, then flatten our BC curve. Another great example of our, our assets, I think, as British Columbians, all of us, is our humility. When we make mistakes, we learn. We adapt our behavior and in doing so, inspire each other to do better. The past weeks have shown what can happen in some places, on some occasions, when we let our guard down. They've shown us how COVID-19 bursts our bu bubble when we fail to stay within it. They've shown us that we must recommit to using our COVID sense. This means physical distancing saves lives. Wearing a mask is the right thing to do when we can't maintain physical distance. Keeping our number of contacts small, knowing the upside in being outside, washing our hands often and for 20 seconds with soap and water. Listening and being respectful to people who are asking us to take actions in their store or restaurant that will keep us healthy and stop the spread. And we want to really emphasize that today and of course staying home always not going to school not going to work 
not going out if we're sick. We must continue to do what is proven works for us. We must use our COVID sense to keep us safe and stop the spread. Using our COVID spread sense will drive our numbers of new cases into decline. It will prove once again that we bend the curve, not the rules, and when we do that, we make all the difference. As we approach our BC Day long weekend, let's acknowledge this is our first BC Day celebration in our new BC normal. Our BC plans for the coming long weekend must ensure that we play safe, that we stand apart, and that we stay 100% all in in our commitment to renew the fight to stop the spread. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle de, des 24 et 25 juillet, celle des 25 et 26 juillet, et celle du 26 juillet jusqu'au 27 juillet en mi-journée. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer deux nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 dans le régime de santé de Vancouver Coastal pour un total de 193 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. Pour la pr première période de référence qui s'étend jusqu'au 25 juillet, nous avons eu 36 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence qui s'étend jusqu'au 26 juillet, nous avons eu 21 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, 24 nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés. Cela représente euh, 81 euh, nouveaux cas depuis vendredi pour un total de 3500 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Il y a euh, parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 11 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 3 en soins intensifs. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to uh, everyone on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. Please also take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Richard Zisman, Global News. Uh, Dr. Henry, we're seeing uh, increased uh, cases of people with U.S. license plates uh, here in British Columbia being harassed when they go to the grocery store or elsewhere. I know you've been asked about this before, but I'm just wondering what sort of advice you have for those who are harassing. And do you have any advice for those who are being harassed? Because, and do you agree with Premier Horgan's assertion earlier today that those people should change their license plate to BC license plates or uh, take, the bike, uh, take a bike or take the bus? Well, I'll start by saying that, you know, I'm, I always encourage people to take active transit or transport so that biking, running, those are all things that are good for us in many ways. Um, but when it comes to people, I have said many times, and I know this to be a fact, there are many reasons why people have different license plates here in British Columbia. Many people returned, many Canadians, British Columbians returned from living in the, Uni the United States, whether they had been there for a short time or a long period of time. And who would blame them, uh, considering what's happening now? Many people came home to look after elderly family members, and we need to respect that. We also need to respect that many people have been here for a long time. They may have done their, their isolation, and they are members of our community. And we need to treat everybody with kindness and with respect. We do not know everybody's story. And I think we need to pay attention to the fact that we all are in this together whether our license plate is from somewhere else, whether it's from Alberta, whether it's from California, or whether it's from here. We are here now, and we all need to do the things to keep each other safe here now. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? I do. Dr. Henry, I'm hearing from a lot of parents as we head towards, you know, the, the weather is warming up, and we're heading towards the long weekend, and even thinking about school, and they're trying to plan gatherings uh, with other families. Can you speak to the specifics around children playing with other children if the parents are distant, like at a water park or a beach or in a backyard? Or are there safe ways to do this um, in terms of uh, young, and is there different ages that are safer than others? Yeah, so we do know that younger children under the age of 10 in particular seem to be less likely to be infected, less likely to pass it on to others. But the basics really still the same. Smaller numbers, 
keep the groups of kids together as small as possible. And yes, we need parents to, to maintain our safe distances. We do know that young kids as well, it's challenging for them to understand what a meter is or two meters. And the focus really should be on avoiding physical contact with, with the children who are outside your immediate family and your immediate bubble. So those are the things that parents need to consider. And of course, the really important thing, get outside. It's perfectly safe to play outside and it's better for us all. But washing our hands carefully before we go out and then after we've been playing, particularly before we have meals and things like that. Those are the important things that will keep us safe. We also know that this virus is not spread through water, particularly in pools when it's been chlorinated and it's very sensitive as well. It's killed quite easily by ultraviolet light. So when we're outside, that's better. So those are the really important things. Keep the numbers small. Try and avoid touching each other, physical contact with the, the children who are outside your close immediate uh, household or your bubble that you've uh, had agreements to stay together on. And those are the things that are, are most important right now. Next question is from Zara Premji, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. So this week, we expect to hear about the reopening of schools. Now, the Premier asked parents to have a plan B ready just in case. So what can you tell parents about what you would like to see schools have in place in order for them to open safely in September? Yeah, well, we've been spending a lot of time on this with a large number of people, and we'll have much more details coming uh, later this week. Um, but I will say that we all need to, you know, there are many unknowns um, around this virus, and we have seen that, uh, we've seen what's happened all around us, and we know that uh, we can't be complacent. So it is important for families to be flexible and for workplaces to think about being flexible as well as we come into the fall. I will say we have done a lot of looking at what are the unintended negative consequences of children not being in classroom learning situations. And we know there's um, tremendous impacts on emotional health, on mental health, on other factors around children's ability to socialize and to learn. And that's why it is so important and we're putting so much effort into making sure we can do this in a way that supports all children and their learning needs in the, in the fall. Um, and those vary by age of children as well. So these are things we all need to think about. We'll have some more details about what we're planning um, in the system coming up, as you say, later this week. But I think we all need to understand that we've not been through this before. We've not in, at least um, most of us have not. There are a few people who are over 100 who have been through something very similar, but they probably don't remember it. So we need to learn together and we need to plan for all contingencies. As we've said many times, when this virus is anywhere, we're at risk everywhere. So we need to pay attention to what's happening around us as well. Um, but I do think that there is absolutely ways that we can get almost all, hopefully all, children back into a, an in-class learning situation in the fall and we're going to be planning towards that. Do you have a follow-up, Zara? Yes, definitely. So would you consider making masks mandatory then for children and teachers? And if not, why not? And if you don't mind doing that in French as well. So, uh, you know, I've said this many times as well. Um, masks are an additional layer in certain situations. And I don't see uh, making masks mandatory in school settings being a reasonable approach right now, at least from the evidence that I have seen. I do think there are some situations where masks would be helpful, particularly on uh, transit back and forth to school, in some of those situations where you may be in close contact, not ab able to keep the physical distancing. Um, so in transitions, perhaps in hallways. I also think we need to remember that much of the transmission that we see in workplaces and school settings is between the adults in those, those settings. So there might be a role for masks in areas where adults are together, where they, um, like um, I'm thinking of break rooms and things, where they may not be able to maintain their physical distancing as well. But at this point, there's no intention to make it mandatory and certainly not in the in-classroom situations for young children. Merci beaucoup. Ce n'est pas notre intention pour le moment euh, de, de, de mettre en place une loi obligatoire pour les masques. On comprend l'utilité des masques. Euh, Moi-même, j'utilise des masques souvent quand je vais à l'épicerie, par exemple. Mais, euh, mais euh, 
ce n'est pas à notre sens utile et cela ne suit pas l'évidence d'avoir une loi obligatoire, c'est-à-dire un mandat obligatoire pour les masques. Il, y a des, il se peut que ce soit utile, par exemple, pour les adultes dans un contexte éducatif euh, de porter des masques et on, on, on va euh, sûrement la, euh, considérer euh, cela. Mais en général, il n'y a pas une... Nous sommes convaincus que la bonne, la bonne voie, le bon chemin, c'est de, de faire des recommandations fondées sur la science et dans ce contexte, ce n'est pas à notre sens de la bonne voie maintenant d'avoir un droit euh, obligatoire, c'est-à-dire un mandat obligatoire pour les masques. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. First one for you, Minister Dix, just regarding American plates and people being harassed. In the Yukon, they brought in a program where people have stickers to show that they get to the process and they are the thumbs up from um, the province or the territory there. Any consideration to move into something like that here, considering we're going to be in this situation for some time? Sorry, I don't think I quite quite underst understood fully the question. In the Yukon, they brought in a process or uh, they people get stickers on the cars. If they have foreign place, they get a sticker on the car that says, you know, they're okay to be here. Is there any consideration to doing something like that in British Columbia for people with foreign plates? Uh, well, we don't reject any uh, suggestions out of hand, and sure, I'm sure we'll take a look at that, maybe talk to our friends in the Yukon. Uh, let me say this about it. Uh, it's everybody's obligation uh, to behave well. Uh, I heard a question earlier, it talked about people harassing. Well, it's never okay to harass, and uh, it's the obligation of Canadian Border Services to ensure that our laws are upheld, and they are working very hard to do that. Our uh, public servants worked hard to ensure that the quarantine of, of Canadians returning to Canada and others, including temporary foreign workers, were upheld. And this is true, by the way, of people visiting British Columbia, whether it's from other provinces or, uh, or through whatever circumstances they come here. That when people come here, they are, of course, our guests, but uh, that means treating everybody well, uh, means treating not just uh, uh, doctors and nurses and health sciences professionals well, but treating uh, people who work in liquor stores well and waiters well and people who are uh, serving in any uh, service industry well or people who are, uh, who are working in hotels or resorts or any other facility. In other words, we have an obligation to one another that's especially true in these times to be kind. And being kind is an effective way we found in British Columbia of fighting the virus. So the obligation is not just on those uh, here uh, to, of course, understand that um, it will be other people who, we, who have the legal foundation to enforce the law and to try and be fair to everybody, but also the obligation on people who might be visiting British Columbia from other places in Canada to, uh, to treat the people that they meet here like they were their own family and their own friends in their own neighborhood. Do you have a follow-up question, Lisa? Yes, this one's for Dr. Henry. When you're talking about children, Dr. Henry, you mentioned that kids, um, you know, are less likely to transmit if they're and, and and catch the virus if they're under 10, but that they still should remain in their bubble, only having close contact with those in their bubble. How is this going to be possible when kids return to school, or should we consider that any child in our children's class are now part of our bubble? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that we're looking at, you know, how do we create those cohorts where you have the co the contacts but you minimize contacts with others in the school. So those are the options that we're looking at because that's a, really the only practical way to do it um, and it needs to be done differently for different age groups of children. So more details about that will come out. But absolutely, and you know, we've looked at that in um, people having work cohorts, we're having um, small numbers that uh, that you stay with on an ongoing basis that we know we can connect with. We know who it is that you you spend your time with. Um, and so if a case arises, we can effectively care for people and isolate people if need be. Next question is from Carissa Gall, Haida Gwaii Observer. 
Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, regarding the 14th confirmed case of COVID-19 on Haida Gwaii, is that case also a local resident believed to be linked to the 13 cases announced on Friday? And are they self-isolating at home or in, or in hospital? Uh, currently, everybody is self-isolating at home. Um, they're being monitored daily uh, by Northern Health and by the community. And yes, it is another community member, and we believe, although um, they're still putting all of the, the, the pieces together, but yes, we believe it's linked to the cases that uh, are already um, in the community in Haida Gwaii. Do you have a follow-up, Carissa? No, thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Gordon Hoekstra, Vancouver Sun. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. A couple questions around testing. Um, Dr. Henry, with the uptick in infections, and I think there's, I mean, at least from a public point of view, maybe perhaps uh, some delay in uh, testing in interior health, Vancouver health, even in lower mainland here, where people have to wait in line a bit. I think BC's capacity is about 300, 3,500 a day, although it doesn't always do that. Is there a need for expanded testing? Um, so our capacity is about 8,000 tests a day now, um, and we are expanding that capacity. But yes, um, there has been some challenges, particularly the interior with large numbers of people who were exposed at a number of different events, and, and there were some equipment uh, challenges uh, over the past two weekends as well. So um, that is being uh, sorted out, and actually we are looking at enhancing, and uh, over this weekend they were able to really drive up the testing of people who were at risk. Um, I'm not uh, aware of any delays in testing in the Lower Mainland. That's mostly been uh, working fairly well. Uh, our average turnaround time is 22 hours. Um, that is a little bit longer in some areas compared to others, but it is something we're watching very carefully. But we have said, and we are planning to ramp up to um, at least double what we are able to do now as we move into the fall, because we know there will be other respiratory viruses that could potentially be causing uh, illness as well. So rapid testing will be really important. Do you have a follow-up, Gordon? I will say as well that one of the things that is really important, if you are somebody who's been in, exposed and you have any symptoms and you're being tested, you must isolate until you get your test results back. And I know that's frustrating, especially if it, and in some um, cases it may take uh, two to three days, but it is very important that you do stay away from others during that period of time because that's when you're most infectious to others if, you're, if you are testing positive. Do you have a follow-up, Gordon? I do. Um, just wondering, uh, BC appears to have taken a, a, maybe a slightly different approach than some jurisdictions, including within Canada, on testing. I mean, BC's testing rate is slow compared to many jurisdictions in the world, including within the province. I'm just wondering, I mean, and I think initially you heard the WHO general directors talk about, you know, sort of the message was test, test, test. I'm just wondering if you can comment on BC's approach to testing and sort of explain what, what the thinking has been. As I've said many, many times, <laughs> yes. Um, we started very early on with widespread testing to understand where this virus was coming in our community. Once we had community spread, we focused on ensuring we could test those people who we knew might have an impact on our healthcare system. So we focused our testing, and in, during that period of time, our test positive rate went up. So we were testing the right people at the right time. As our illness in the community decreased and we got um, control of the pandemic, as our curve was flattened, we went to more widespread testing again. So now there's widespread testing across the province. There's access across the province for anyone with any symptoms. And we also do testing in, for people who are asymptomatic in specific situations. For example, workplaces, long-term care homes, um, you know, with long-term care home, we test all of the residents, all of the staff, whether they have symptoms or not. We know some of these high-risk exposures, for example, in uh, some of the nightclubs, whether people have symptoms, if they've been identified as being a close contact, um, we test them regardless of symptoms. So the important thing is that we're testing the right people at the right time and able to make sure that we have access to testing available for people. Um, it has been shown uh, around the world that uh, doing testing of asymptomatic people who have very low risk 
means that you get way more false positives than anybody who truly has the disease, and that creates a burden on our system and unnecessarily uh, uses resources. So we aren't doing that in a broad way here in BC. We're focusing our attention on where testing can make the most difference for the individual, but also for us as a community. And, and quite frankly, one of the reasons our testing rates have come down is because the transmission and the people who are ill with COVID have come down in our province. So there's no need to test people if there's no um, risk or chance that they might be positive for this illness. So that's something that we're focusing on. We're focusing on make sure, making sure we have the tests that are available for the people that need it and that we can do broad testing when it's needed. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Back to the schools announcement that's coming later this week. Um, I don't know if you saw on the weekend, uh, Terry Mooring, the president of the BCTF, tweeted uh, sort of where her membership is at. And she said about half of them were concerned about going back in June, and about a third of them are still really concerned and have medical concerns about going back in September. So my question to you is, do teachers have a right to be worried and concerned for their health if they end up back in the classroom full time in September? You know, I think all of us are worried. All of us don't know what's going to happen. We all have anxieties. And this is why we all need to learn as we go. We're making adjustments as we go. Um, we learned quite a lot about what works and what doesn't work in June. And that's put us in good stead for making sure we have plans for the future that uh, are the safest for all involved, including teachers. And absolutely, we all have some anxieties about going back full time. But I think we need to address those. We need to work together on making sure that we have things in place. And you know, we've, we've not done COVID before, but we've had outbreaks in our school systems before. We know how to handle those, whether it's measles, whether it's influenza, chicken pox, you know, um, pertussis, meningitis. There are many things that happen in, in our congregate settings, particularly in school settings, and we can manage those together. And we need to do that through this pandemic. We know that there are many downside impacts on children in particular, but uh, when they aren't in a school setting, and those can last a lifetime. So we have to balance our risks and make sure that we're as prepared as we can be and as safe as we can be for everybody. But uh, you know, this is a new thing. None of us signed up for having a pandemic. And we all need to, to adapt and make sure we have everything in place to adjust and to support our school communities, our learners, as well as our educators as we're going into the fall. And that's what we're going to be doing. Do you have a follow-up, Shannon? Yeah, uh, the, the cases in Haida Gwaii, it is such a small community. How concerning is an outbreak of this size in a community that small? And what's being done to make sure the people have access to the resources they need there? Yeah, you know, we, th we have been concerned, of course, from the very beginning about the potential impact on many of our remote communities. Many of them are First Nations communities, and the Haida First Nation has been very active on, on supporting their community members across Haida Gwaii um, to, to protect them as much as we can. The other part that we've been working on is making sure we have contingency plans for if and when it is introduced into the community. So one of the key things about declaring the outbreak last week was making sure that uh, that that allowed us to pull the community together so that we could ensure that there was the health resources that were available as they are needed and that people who were being asked to self-isolate either because they were sick or because they were exposed um, got all of the supports they needed in their community and so those um, uh, meetings are ongoing but uh, the community has come together and we're working together to make sure that everybody gets what they need and that we can get through this together. Next question is from Arthur Williams, Prince George Citizen. Hi, it's Dr. Henry. Um, um, sorry, my apologies. Uh, if I'm doing the math right, uh, we've got looking at three new cases in Northern Health. Um, you mentioned one of them is linked to the Haida Gwaii outbreak. Um, are the other two new cases linked to any known outbreak? Um, I'm thinking particularly the, the worker in Site C who tested positive. Uh, there's no additional uh, cases at Site C that I'm aware of. Um, there has been sporadic cases in other communities in Northern Health over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, but there's just the one that's related to Haida Gwaii. Do you have a follow-up, Arthur? Uh, no, that's good. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry, if I could ask you to please repeat your updated orders um, from your opening, the, the feed cutout. So I would like to get to that before the end. Ah, the things that I've amended. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, I will go back to that. Um, as you know, we've been focusing on um, uh, taking actions in areas where we know there has been transmission and so last week we revised the orders around the pubs and restaurants and events that happen in food premises like those to ensure that we had more um, controls in place that uh, prevented people from gathering and mixing and putting both staff and other patrons at risk. And uh, today we've amended the order on mass gatherings to limit the number of people in short-term vacation rentals, including whether they're house rentals, boat rentals, cabins, yurts, hotel rooms. And the number of people is limited to the capacity of the space, um, plus up to a maximum of five visitors. So this is to get at what we were seeing happening in various places around the province where there were people having um, parties in their rental suites or their houses or on boats where there was uh, groups of people. Um, and we know that that was an area where this virus has been transmitted. It is the responsibility of the owner of the property to ensure that the order is adhered to. And additionally, we uh, need to ensure that contact tracing information is collected for everyone, guests and visitors alike, in those settings. We've also clarified uh, in the order about um, what an event is um, and define that a little broader so that people understand it. We were getting a lot of questions about that and, and about what it, the, uh, the maximum number of 50 in terms of an event applies to. And we've re reinforced again that it does not apply to workplaces, work sites, schools, uh, universities, for example. So those are the key things around uh, the amendments of the orders to include um, vacation accommodations and some of the restrictions to reduce the numbers of people in those settings. Thank you. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question today, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. How concerned are you about what, you're, what, what we're seeing in Alberta right now, where on the weekend we had 81 cases, they had 304, there's close to 90 people in hospital there, 17 in ICU. Their, their numbers continue to spike upwards at a, at a much higher degree than here in BC. And this is not a license plate question, but we do get six flights a day from Edmonton and Calgary landing at YVR. Are you concerned over the summer that literally we're going to see be seeing the importation of COVID-19 from Alberta in large numbers? Yeah, you know, obviously I'm concerned about what's happening all around us. Um, Alberta, for, absolutely. We know there's a lot of families who are connected across Alberta. We know that many parts of BC uh, are much closer to Alberta than they are to uh, healthcare services in the Lower Mainland, for example. Um, what we need to focus on is ensuring that when we're here, we're doing the things that keep us all safe here. And if people are here from Alberta, whether they live here or whether they're visiting from Alberta, then we need to ensure that they are part of our team in doing the right things here as well. Um, we have had people introduce uh, the virus here from Alberta, and uh, you know that is a possibility. We know, I know my colleagues in Alberta are working very hard to make sure that they are controlling their outbreak as well and their pandemic. And it, it's, um, it, it's taken a different trajectory than ours. Uh, we need to continue to do the things that we're doing and we invite Albertans to, uh, when they are here, to make sure that they're doing the things we need them to do as well. Do you have a follow-up, Keith? Yes, and this may be covered by the fact you've amended your order. We had reports over the weekend in Osoyoos of, again, mass parties at resorts. Uh, does this now mean that these facilities themselves will have to sort of step up and police their own common rooms and, and uh, visitations by guests? 
Absolutely, and so the onus is on the owner of the property to ensure that this is uh, in place. Um, I will say as well that in, in the Okanagan, in the Lower Mainland, and other parts in British Columbia, uh, we have been stepping up compliance checks uh, on restaurants and bars and, and uh, settings like this, and with the order in place, that will facilitate that as well. I also understand that in places like uh, Third Beach or Second Beach, um, there's uh, some very stern uh, posters of me that have been put up to dissuade people from uh, congregating in large groups so <laughs> maybe that'll be effective too that's all the time we have for today thank you thank you